Dwight D. Eisenhower, following the command, they launched the largest land, air, and sea operation ever undertaken, called Overlord, also known and more popularly known as D-Day. 150,000 troops strong invaded, occupied France to fight the German army. Allied forces suffered casualties. More than 4,000 Allied troops died, 6,000 wounded. But, everybody say but. That's a very important but right there. But the Allies succeeded in breaching Hitler's coastal defense of France on D-Day. It was, everybody say, a turning point. Things were never the same for Hitler after D-Day. It was a, an about face. It was a 180 degree turn. And if you study 11 months followed D-Day before victory was declared. It was not declared instantly, but it was declared ultimately. Well, I hope somebody's listening. It's not a good time for you to be looking down at your phone or playing with a baby right now, clipping your fingernails. This is a very important time, really important time. D-Day was a turning point. If we catch that hint, it'll help you understand the importance of launching an all-out assault upon Satan's front lines knowing there will be casualties, and knowing there was ultimately a casualty in the spirit world. But that casualty only lasted for three days. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. Somebody's tracking with me now, and I can feel it. Somebody's kind of thinking with me now. Three days later, come on, somebody, three days later, that casualty did not stay in the grave. That casualty did not stay in the tomb. <laughs> Three days later, there was the ultimate D-Day offensive assault that ended in what is becoming, for you and I, the ultimate victory, but not yet. Please hear me. Not yet. I want everybody to comprehend with me the absolute urgency of this moment to hear a message that I believe will help you beginning now, right now, to know that if you are not aware of the timing of this hour, you could easily be distracted, you could easily be, you could have your faith assaulted and destroyed, but if you'll simply wake up to the moments in which we are living right now, D-Day has happened, V-E Day is still ahead. Some of y'all know what VE Day stands for, Victory Europe. 11 months after D-Day, that's when we see that the victory was ultimately won. Hallelujah. Now, I want y'all to keep thinking about this for, with me for a moment. Acts 1, 7, Jesus said unto those who were asking him about the times, he said, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons. He said, it's not for you to know the exact uh, hour of the day that is going to be the ultimate victory, and it's not for you to know the season of that ultimate victory. But here's the awesome part of that scripture. The Father has put those things in his own power. His timing is what I want to surrender to. Can I invite you to join me and let's say, God, whenever it's time for victory day, I don't want to be missing out on victory day. I don't want to be somewhere else, and I don't want to be absent 
when it's time for Victory Day. At Victory Day, I could easily have been someone who's been distracted, dissuaded, my faith has been invaded, and I'm giving up. But can I just promise somebody right now, we are living in between D-Day and V-E Day. We must live victoriously between the cross and the day of the Lord. We're still in a war zone, but Hitler's days are numbered. Y'all like a metaphor? If you like a metaphor, then you're going to take this message with you and you're going to remember this for the rest of your life because God, I believe, is working on some of our hearts today in a very special way. Revelation 2, verse number 10 says, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison. You may be tried. You shall have tribulation. But be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. You may have to go through some tribulation. You may have to go through some trials. You may have to even go into prison and you may end up with pain and suffering and see your loved ones die, pass away from this life or walk away from God. But Jesus Christ is saying, don't give up yourself. You be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. He said, he that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh those three words have got to be resounding in our ears today. He that overcometh. Seven times in Revelation, he uses those words. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. And he's not going to be hurt of the first death technically because the first and the second death, they're only entrances into the majestic power of Almighty God where he will give you a crown of life. Somebody say amen. Now let's back up to Genesis, and I'm going to translate in a modern, easy-to-understand translation with you today going forward because I want everybody to track with me quickly without tripping on any words. Genesis 3.14 says, Then the Lord said to the serpent, when it was time for accounting, when it was time for reckoning, it was time to, to tally up and, and, to, and to pay up uh, the, the, the problems and the, the, the curse that was coming upon Adam and Eve because they had disobeyed God. They had eaten of the forbidden fruit. There came a point when the Lord turned to the serpent and he says, because you've done this, you are cursed more than all animals, domestic and wild. You will crawl on your belly, groveling in the dust as long as you live. And then verse number 15 comes bursting forth as the most amazing prophecy that transcends time and scripture. He said, I will cause hostility between you, devil, between you, serpent, and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. Isn't that cool that it says he will strike your head? He's right here telling Eve, you're going to have a baby someday who is going to be the fatality. He's going to deal a fatal blow to this serpent right here. This serpent right here is not going to have ultimate prevailing power not yet but someday prophecy jesus christ very clearly very clearly spells out for us in the word of god that we are living in a time right now that is literally between that moment in time i believe when jesus christ has stricken the head he is he's, he's rather he has struck the heel of the enemy in the in the fact that that he has literally put him in a place where the the, the enemy was able to strike the heel of god by putting him on the cross but it was not a an ultimate and a deadly blow oh hallelujah he will strike your head that's the ultimate scripture right there because it's saying that the devil will not have ultimate victory do you have that on the screen right now verse number 15 let's really catch this and understand it because this is absolutely urgent for moving forward in this message this morning the devil will be the one who is given liberty to strike the heel of your offspring eve but just striking the heel 
is not deadly and it will not cost him his eternal life and it will not cost him forever. But you know what? His offspring, rather, will be the one who will be dealt the final blow. You will strike his head, but he will strike, he will, you will strike his heel, but he will strike your head. It's kind of a little tongue twister, I know. The striking of the head is telling us that that's like a sledgehammer to the head of the devil. And the striking of the heel is a similar blow, but in a place much less devastated. And we know that Jesus Christ's heel was struck when he died for us on the cross. That is when he had surrendered to death. He had, the scripture says, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, and he gave his life for you and for me. He died on Calvary so that we would have a shot. Rather, we would have assurance, folks, if we overcome and if we're faithful unto death. Come on, somebody. I want us to catch this. You lean, lean up in your seats a little bit, and let's talk about VE Day, and let's talk about what led up to VE Day. There would have been no victory, ultimate victory over Hitler if there had not been a D-Day 11 months before. On June 6, 1944, as we said, more than 156 American, British, and Canadian troops stormed 50 miles of the fiercely defended beaches of Normandy. That day was a critical turning point in World War II. D simply means day. Day zero. The day before would have been day minus one. The day after was day Plus one. They called it D Day for Operation Overlord. It was the day of prominence, of importance, and of supremacy when it came to all the forces acting as one unit and coming together, focusing on a strategic place where they could strike the head of Hitler. That's right. That's right. Hitler had been doing some heel striking. But his days were numbered. Now, I just want to make sure everybody understands as I compare Hitler to the devil today that I'm not the first one. Hitler was, was documented by a close friend to have been, um, he had experienced at age 17 a weird transformation in his utterance. Close friend wrote a book called The Psychopathic God, Adolf Hitler. His name is Robert G.L. Waite. And he wrote these words. After gazing intensely for a few, for a full minute upon Hitler, he began to speak. Never before and never again have I heard Adolf Spittler's, Hitler speak as he did in that hour. And he thought there was something strange about Hitler that night. It was as if another being spoke out of his body and moved him as much as it did me. At age 17, I rather felt as though he himself listened with astonishment and emotion to what burst forth. It was with elementary force. What Hitler said that night, what Hitler said that night has been lost, but one thing was burned into his friend Kubizek's memory. Adolf did not speak of becoming an artist or an architect. Now he saw himself as the Messiah of his people. At a Nazi Christmas celebration in 1926, Hitler said, Christ was the greatest early fighter in the battle against the world enemy, the Jews. The work that Christ started but could not finish, I, Adolf Hitler, will conclude. Hitler considered the Jew to be the devil personified. 
He heard voices as he lay on his hospital bed in 1918 telling him to rescue his motherland from the Jews. I believe Satan lied to Hitler and that he convinced Hitler that the Jews were evil, thus justifying his goal to exterminate them. In reality, Hitler was used by Satan to become a personified version in the flesh of Satan's ugly work of exterminating and eliminating the Jews from the planet. Hitler's track record is staggering. Listen to these total numbers of Jews killed by top concentration camps in World War II. Auschwitz, one million killed by Hitler. Treblinka, 750,000 killed by Hitler. Belzec, 5,500, 5,050, 5,100, how do you say 550000? 000? 550,000. Sobibor, however you say that, 200,000 died. Chelmo, 150,000 died. Lublin, 50,000 died. You know what a better name is for those concentration camps? I would say would be an extermination camp. Hitler reached the height of self-delusion claiming he was a Messiah type. But I've got to stop right here and tell everyone who's listening, Hitler's days were numbered. D-Day came and D-Day left Hitler crippled and Hitler was no longer able to move forward as he had so grandiosely envisioned in his own heart and his own mind. But can I tell you folks that you saw the video, we've talked about it and I want everybody to remember that there were not just a, it was not just an immediate, an immediate turnaround, but it was an assault that brought about 11 months of eventual destruction of Hitler himself. The 11 months of war continued. They did not stop at the, at the, at the D-Day confrontation, but those 11 months were 11 months where lies continued, propaganda continued. There are, there are propaganda videos that you can watch to this day if you'd care to, and you can see they've been translated from German into English, and they're talking about how crazy the Americans are, and, and there are, everybody's just relaxed and enjoying themselves, and there's no worries, nothing to be afraid of. And I'm going to tell you, Hitler was doing his best, be, very best to make it look like he was really winning when all along he was on the very sad side of losing. Folks, D-Day was a critical turning point in World War II, and I've got to tell everybody that D-Day, the day of the cross of Jesus Christ, was that day of critical turning for you and for me in this world we're living in today. And I'm not talking about a world war. I'm talking about an eternal war. I'm talking about a war that, is, that has been beginning, that has begun from the very beginning of time and when it is over. But folks, when there is a victory day, I don't want to miss it. You got to think about this. I mean, it was a matter of a week or less before D-Day. Germany's Führer, Adolf Hitler, was at the Berghof, it was called. It was his residence in the Bavarian Alps. Everyone there knew an inv invasion was likely in the near future, but the atmosphere was not nervous. To the contrary, it was relaxed. In the evening, almost festive, a group of guests and military aides would gather at the complex's tea house, and Hitler would hold forth on favorite topics, such as the great men of history and Europe's future. And that very evening, before the offensive of the Allies, on that very evening of June 5th, Hitler and his entourage watched the latest newsreels. Then they talked about films and theater, stayed up until 2 a.m. trading reminiscences. 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 So Hitler's associate, Joseph Goebbels, wrote, it was almost like the good old times. Hitler went to bed about 3 a.m. and told them not to wake him up. And on that fateful day, he was fast asleep and did not awaken until close to noon. He got himself a good nine hours of sleep. And while that sleep was being enjoyed, his front lines were being invaded, never to be reversed. But history tells us he awoke and he wasn't 
overly upset. In fact, on D-Day, he woke up and he was feeling rather relieved. Boy, you talk about some kind of insanity. And he was cheerful and felt as though everything was okay trying to encourage everybody around him and make everyone feel like this was necessary, that the allies had finally come to the place where they could be contained and where they could be killed. So everybody just relax, it's all good. Oh, come on somebody, I want y'all to hear what I'm saying. I, I feel like there's some folks that are really listening right now and you're trying to catch something, I'm trying to bring it to you. It was not until 11 months later nearly that in, on April 11th of 1940. 1944, 1945, excuse me. It was on 1945, April 30th, that Hitler took his own life by bullet shot to his head and he poisoned that of his mistress. And then it was of that next week, on May 8th, 1945. Somebody, somebody, somebody join me and say May 8th, 1945. There's a few older folks here today who are seasoned saints who remember that a little better than the rest of the younger, but there's something very special about May 8th uh, in 1945. We're talking about 74 years ago this past May, so very few of us were, were old enough to be aware of what was even happening back then, but folks, the, the memory, the victory, and the ultimate, the ultimate celebration literally continues to this day. It was on May 8th of 1945, 11 months later that finally the Germans laid down their arms and they conceded defeat. And I want to tell you what a celebration resounded around the world on that day. Can I tell you to this day there's celebrations around the globe because there was a very important victory that was won and that victory was the Victory, victory Europe Day, which means if Europe is victorious, then there's something that happened in, victory, in Europe that, that helped the entire world to be victorious, and that was the the destruction and the dismantling of Hitler's forces and his war machine and he himself had been as he had requested incinerated in a garden nearby his bunker along with his mistress and when they finally got to Hitler there were only a few bones left according to the stories and the history so now I want us just to relax okay I want you all to stop right now and start getting happy about where we're at. I want, I want y'all to stop fighting over the fact in your prayer that God is not doing what you want him to do. And that it just doesn't seem like maybe you can really trust what you're reading in your Bible. And that you just maybe are, you're not seeing the results that you had hoped maybe years ago. And maybe there are things in your present life that are, that are, talking against your experience with God and trying to undermine your, 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 your faith in God. Can I tell you, if the devil can undermine your faith, he can undermine the effect of D-Day for you. It's sad to say there were some people who gave in and believed Hitler's report during the 11 months between D-Day and VE Day because they simply were duped that the enemy himself was really telling them the truth. But it's time for some of us to say, I'm not going to listen to the enemy's voice. I'm not going to listen to the voice of someone who's undermining my faith. My faith is going to stand strong, and I'm not going to be one who gives up between D-Day and Victory Day. The cross of Jesus Christ is literally that which has begun the offensive. It did not finish it completely because you and I are still on the planet. And I'm going to tell you, the devil is still on the loose. He sure is. He's, if you don't think he's on the loose, just look at the headlines. Look at our world, our society. Folks, we live in a day when people call evil good and good evil. The devil's on the loose. See, our faith could be like, wow, why? Why is the devil on the loose? Jesus died on the cross. Now you're not going to ask that anymore. Now you're going to realize the ultimate assault that is going to win the war has already happened. It didn't happen on the beaches of Normandy. It happened on the cross called Calvary on Mount Golgotha. I want to tell you the cross of Jesus Christ is our place where the victory has been won, but we have ultimate victory that is yet to come. Let's just, let's just turn in our scriptures and get a little bit scholarly for a moment and understand Romans 16, 20 compared to what I read 
and I kind of struggled around with, with my language when I was trying to explain to you about Satan's heel, uh, the, the Lord's heel, see I'm about to do it again, the Lord's heel being stricken and the devil's head being struck a deadly blow. Here it is. In Romans 16, 20, the Bible says the God of peace will soon, everybody say soon, crush Satan under your feet. God Almighty will soon crush Satan. It's not yet. Don't be afraid. Don't freak out. Don't get upset. Not yet. It's okay to say not yet, but Satan, your days are numbered. I'm living. When we walk out of here, I want us to walk out of here with this, this phrase in our head. I'm living right now between D-Day and Victory Day. And when Victory Day comes, I don't want to be someone who's down in the dumps and all gloomy and convinced that the devil really has the victory because he does not have the victory. The scripture says that soon the God of peace will crush Satan under my feet. A few of us need to say, God, I'm not going to be freaked out. God, I'm not going to give up. God, I'm going to keep on serving. I'm going to keep on having faith in you. I live between the ultimate victory and the victory that was won on Calvary. Folks, it's an amazing metaphor, and it's ama an, amazing, an amazing parallel between the 11 months, uh, between D-Day and Victory Europe Day. I cannot imagine living between those 11 months and scratching our heads and wondering, did D-Day really work? All those lives, did they really die for a reason that was profitable, or did they die in vain? You see how we could sit around in 2019 and say, I wonder if the cross was really worth it. I wonder if my own personal salvation, my efforts to serve and please God, are they really worth it? This message is for somebody who's really been thinking about giving up. Because I've thought about it myself. And I've wondered, you know, what about this? But the Lord came thundering down on me a couple weeks ago with the thought that D-Day was not the moment that there was ultimate victory. D-Day was the invasion D-Day was the ultimate moment of crushing, was, was ultimate moment of crushing the front lines, but it was not the ultimate moment of crushing Hitler. Hitler was just a pawn in the hands of the enemy. And I believe the Lord has allowed it to be a message for today. It's such a high price. Yes, I, I would hate to say, but, but folks, we need to understand that Almighty God has the, has the authority today, according to the Scripture, Luke 10, 19, Jesus said, I have given you authority over all the power of the enemy. You can walk among snakes and scorpions and crush them. Nothing will injure you. But folks, if you don't let him give you that authority, you will walk under the power of the enemy. It's a choice to make today. Jesus Christ is the God Almighty who has given us power. And it's because of the cross of Jesus Christ. I want us to catch some very important things here. I'm almost finished. Romans 1.16. I'm not ashamed of this good news about Christ. It is the power of God. Come on, somebody. It is the power of God at work right here, right now. Between D-Day and Victory Day, I've got to step back and say, God Almighty, yeah, there's some issues. Yeah, there's some doubt sometimes. Sometimes there's a cloudy day and sometimes there's some misery. Sometimes I just wonder why in the world this life is turning turned out this way but can I tell you do not give up you're just living in an interval between two very important days I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ it is the power of God at work and it's at work right now saving everyone who believes you got to believe those who don't believe it's not saving you and those who do not believe will not have power. Those who do not believe will push away the good news about Christ. Those who do not have power, those who do not have, have the, do not believe will be those who fall victim and pray to someone worse than Hitler. And that is the very one who, it seems, filled Hitler with his venom and animosity. Folks, I would not want to stand in a position other than believing and having power of God at work right here, right now. Hallelujah. All right? So here it is. The cross changed everything. Let's remember that. 
I'm thankful for the cross of Jesus Christ. Can, can anybody get the feeling right now that Pastor Heyman could probably go about another 90 minutes on this thought? I'm serious. Folks, but I'm not going to do it. The cross changed everything. Don't you ever forget the cross of Jesus Christ. I'm so thankful. I want to stay near the cross. Jesus, keep me. Keep my mind on the cross. Keep me living under the shadow of the cross. I want to tell you why. Because the cross is literally the turning point in the war. You look at me and say, what war? Well, it's the war where this Jesus Christ himself has his heel flicked. Between that moment and Jesus Christ crushes the head of Satan. Two events happen. Two events in Genesis 3.15. Two events. The turning point was the striking of Jesus' heel. That was his death. But just because his heel has been stricken does not mean yet that the devil's head has been crushed. Not yet. Come on, somebody, say not yet. What I'm doing right now is I'm helping you realize a devil is working overtime. Now, some of you probably just thought of a very important scripture, and so did I. Revelation 20, verse 10. I've got it ready for you right here. Revelation. Actually, that's not it. Sorry. It's another one. I've got it. Revelation 12, 12. Revelation 12, 12. That's it right there. Therefore, rejoice, O heavens, you who live in the heavens, rejoice. But terror will come on the earth and the sea. For the devil has come down to you in great anger, having great wrath, knowing that he has a little time. His days are numbered. Folks, the devil was not after us as hard before the cross as he has been after the cross. I want us to recognize there's no wonder we need the power of God like they didn't have in the Old Testament. We've got to have the power of God between the, the striking of Jesus' heel and the crushing of Satan's head like never before. Why? Because the devil has come down having great wrath. He is filled with fury and anger. He knows that his timing is short. In fact, I want a few of us to just kind of become aware of what the devil already knows his days are numbered but you know what just because his days are numbered doesn't mean that we're going to just relax give up no 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 that means we're going to do the opposite we're going to lean into this assault we're going to lean into this warfare we're going to say god you have given us this moment you've given us this time between d-day and victory day to prove that you inside is more powerful than anyone around us we have got power on the inside working on the outside and jesus in me makes a majority i can do all things through christ who strengthens me Right here in the middle of this assault, I can make it. Oh, hallelujah. Can I just tell you here, as I wrap this message up, the way it looks at the end for the devil? Y'all be good with that? Here's the way it looks at the end for the devil. He's, he's not going to be in his bunker, give up. No. Revelation 20, 10, then. Oh, I love that word, then. <laughs> Can I just break this to you right now? Not yet. Not yet. That's why we get up and leave here with heartburn, with a little ingrown toenail, or maybe with a headache, or maybe with disease in our body. Then. Come on, somebody. Then. Then. Jesus is coming. Jesus' victory is coming. What's it going to look like for the devil? Then. The devil who had deceived them. Who? Who's them? Everybody who didn't believe that D-Day really was the turning point and didn't believe that they were really living in a short interval of time between D-Day and Victory Day. Oh, hallelujah, I hope this is making sense to our wonderful friends from overseas because some of you may have never really even heard the incredible story about D-Day and Victory Day in the United States. It's something we celebrate, and it is a powerful concept, and it really is a worldwide event because it is called World War II. But can I tell you something more important than world war is spirit war. God just gives us a little glimpse at spirit war by looking at world war. 
That spirit war is so much greater. Now, when the devil who has been deceiving the people of God, he is thrown into the fiery lake of burning sulfur, he joins the beast and the false prophet. There they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. And that's when God's people will be able to celebrate. Right? Hallelujah. Can I just share with you what it's going to look like for you and me? It's going to look like this. The Bible says the day of the Lord will come. Oh, hallelujah. Come on, somebody. Let's get excited. The day of the Lord will come, and it will come unexpectedly as a thief. And I want to be those one of those who are watching and waiting for him, and I'm not surprised because I've been waiting for it every day of my life. Uh, folks, the day of the Lord will come, 2 Peter 3.10, as unexpectedly as a thief. Then the heavens will pass away with a terrible noise. The very elements themselves will disappear in fire. Earth and everything on it will be found to deserve judgment. But can I tell you right now, <laughs> I want to present some exciting and relieving news to everyone here why Satan seems to be having a free-for-all. It's because he's in an interval. Hallelujah. How many of you wondered why people have backslidden right out of the church and walked away from God and you don't understand it? They have no reason to do that. God has done too much for them. How many of you wondered why in the world it is that, that people just aren't interested in coming and finding out the things of God? We, just, that's just the case. That's the way the world is today. How many of you have ever wondered why it seemed like things that are just so frustrating that God ought to just come down and strong arm your situation and take care of it? Have anybody ever felt that way before? How many of you have ever felt like, God, you ought to just be able to take one little touch of your finger and touch this disease and make it completely eliminate and, and just vaporize and go away so I can be completely normal again? Well, I'm going to tell you something, folks. That is God's within God's scope of power. But do not forget, there is a day when the day of the Lord will come. The day of the Lord will come. Hallelujah. I, I want to tell you, brothers and sisters, the bottom line is this. We are a people who have got to realize our timing our timing, the day of the Lord will come. Hallelujah. Some people say, since the crime is not being punished quickly, then it's probably safe to just keep doing wrong. But that's a delusion of the enemy of our soul. Every child of God defeats this evil world. Let's look at 1 John 5, 4. It says, we achieve victory through our faith. Through our faith. Every child of God defeats this evil world. If you want to defeat this evil world, say amen. amen. If, if you want to defeat this evil world, remember, it's going to be through our faith. Faith, how is it defined? It's the substance of things hoped for. It's not there, not tangible yet. Come on, somebody. The things hoped for. There's an expectancy. Could I just raise the expectancy of this congregation and everybody, everybody listening right now? Raise the expectancy because Almighty God is at work and He has not forgotten and He is not somewhere. Folks, can I tell you how proud I am today of D D Dwight D. Eisenhower after I've been studying World War II? And I thank God for his leadership and the way that he was able to just forge ahead as the supreme commander and give the commands. But folks, we've got someone so much smarter, someone who can see so much further, someone who has so much greater wisdom, someone who knows the intricacies of your issues and mine. He knows your household. He knows your workplace. He knows your finances. He knows your emotional state. He knows your pain. I want to tell you, his name is greater than the supreme commander. His name is the great supreme God of the universe. Our God is a alive our God cares our God is watching and our God is going to give the command he will give the command hallelujah let's look at it everybody join me in Revelation 21 verse 3 here it is folks this is the way it's going to look for you and me let's all stand together I want us to look at this this is what what the writer said when the Lord gave him a glimpse of the future the Lord let him see for himself what it was going to look like this is what it was going to look like for God's people he said I heard a loud shout from the throne saying look God's home is now among his people he will live with them they will be his people God himself will be with them 
them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. And the one sitting on the throne said, look, I'm making everything new. Revelation 21, 7 says, all who are victorious will inherit all these blessings and I will be their God and they will be my children. But those who gave in during the 11th hour, those who gave in at the last minute, those who gave in during the, the interval between the cross and the victory, the Bible calls them cowards and unbelievers, the corrupt, murderers, immoral, those who practice witchcraft, idol worshipers, all liars, their fate is in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. Folks, Jesus is coming. And that is coming, folks. I want to be going. Don't you and I can't let him catch us as a thief comes in to an unprepared household. Jesus is coming. The day of the Lord will come. I want y'all to catch that. It's not time to be thinking about other things happening today or worried about your week. Right, right now is a moment in time. We all need to be thinking, Lord God, thank you for stopping me in my tracks right here, right now. And thank you, Lord, for helping me realize I am now like the sons of Issachar. Lord, I can understand the times in which I live, what Israel ought to do, what I ought to do is I just need to buckle down and be more faithful. I need to buckle down and make it every service I possibly can. I need to buckle down and pray a little harder. I need to buckle down and I need to read my Bible. I need to be more faithful to God than I've ever been because I am living between the D-Day of the cross and the victory day of the rapture of the church. The victory day of heaven. Amen. Singers, would you join me? Would you bow your heads as we get ready to sing? Lord, I pray that you'd let this message begin to make an impact. Make an impact, Lord. Speak to us, Jesus. Lord, let this transcend the voice of this mere mortal. Lord, you know my effort to communicate the burden you've laid upon my heart. Lord, God, I pray that this message would help us to escalate our holiness, escalate our faithfulness, escalate our prayerfulness, God. Lord, raise us, Jesus. Hallelujah. Lord, as a congregation, let us come before you and recognize the gospel, the good news, did not exist before the cross. And we thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the good news. Lord, and we're not ashamed of the good news of Jesus Christ. Yes, we do live in a time when the world would like to shame your people. But, Lord, we're not going to be ashamed. Lord, the world would like, to, would like to look down their nose at the world, at the church, and wonder why in the world they're so faithful. But God, give it so deeply a revelation to everyone. Expose us to this truth permanently, Lord, that the day of the Lord shall come. Lord Jesus, your victory shall prevail. You are coming soon, Lord. At your coming, Lord God, let us not be lackadaisical. Let us not be wondering. Let us not be, let us, let us not be languishing, Lord. Let us be a church on the move. In Jesus' name, I want us to start thinking about this song, one of my favorites that has just come, up, come across the wires lately to me, something I've been singing virtually every day, folks. I am going to see a victory. This altar is open for those of you who'd like to come up during this song and just make this a heartbeat and make this something that is a part of your everyday life. And I pray in Jesus' name that the Lord will let this get into our spirits and use us to take this message into our world. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. Everybody say, I'm going to see a victory. Oh, come on. Say, I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. Yes, I am. When the darkness comes, it won't breathe in. Because the God I know serves only how to triumph. My God will never fail. My God will never fail. I'm going to see a victory.
Ghost today, let me invite you forward to receive the Spirit. If you'd like the Holy Ghost today, I want you to make your way all the way up to this altar area. Push your way forward. In fact, why don't we just invite everybody for a concluding prayer to join us right up close around the front. Would you just make your way on up here around the front as God's family. Let's gather together as the community of the Holy Ghost filled and those who are believing for those who do not have the Holy Ghost to be filled today. In Jesus' name, thank you, Lord. Every step you take is a step shaken.